Well, thank you, John, I think. Uh, John and I have a deal. The, the deal is that uh, if he doesn't tell the truth about me, I won't tell any lies about him. And, and he kept to his deal, I have to say. So uh, uh, I, will, I will soldier on. But thank you very much for that very kind uh, introduction. The one thing, that you misled people here. You said you were the only thing between them and dinner, and now here I am. I just want to say a few words. I want to say what a tremendous honor it is for me to receive this award, particularly as it comes from an organization whose focus is on the important role that public policy plays in our country. And as John's indicated, I've been privileged to work in a variety of rewarding positions as a ministerial assistant in the 70s, a constitutional law professor in the 80s, an MLA and cabinet minister in the 90s, Dean of Law in the 2000s, and uh, university president for the last eight years. So I'm probably ready for the crypt. But uh, it, it's been wonderful. Those roles have been truly rewarding. I guess the one thing that you know is that whatever other reason they may have decided to give me this award, it isn't because I can hold a job. Um, but be that as it may, the one thing that is common to all of these positions is the opportunity they've provided me to influence public policy. And that, for me, is something that has been hugely important and has given me huge gratification. I say this because public policy is the instrument through which we as a community give effect to our collective hopes and dreams. It's the mechanism through which democracy translates the will of the people into the programs and practices of governments, as John has suggested. And it's the means through which our country has been shaped into a distinctive polity that is celebrated at home and admired around the world. Not without its faults, but nonetheless a remarkable place with a distinctive culture and a distinctive set of public policies that reflect that culture. And I must say, for me, the value of this instrument really came home, was made most apparent, uh, when I was privileged to become part of a government that was elected to bring about transformative change, and that was the Harcourt government in the 1990s. Indeed, the first challenge I was given by Premier Mike Harcourt was all about changing public policy. When as Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, I was charged with delivering on our new government's commitments to recognize Aboriginal title, reactivate stalled treaty talks with ANISCA, Sophie knows all about this, establish a province-wide treaty-making process, and reach a cost-sharing agreement with the federal government. Just a few modest reforms to be achieved against the backdrop of a BC Supreme Court decision which some of you will remember, held only a few months previous to this, held that Aboriginal rights had been completely extinguished within the province of British Columbia. And yet, notwithstanding that decision in that context, we were able to achieve most of those objectives that Mike had set and we had committed to. And similarly, the mandate I was given as Forest Minister positioned me to oversee the introduction of a range of different legislative measures that in their time were groundbreaking, the Forest Practices Code, the Forest Renewal Plan, the Forest Land Reserve, and to aid in the development of a protected area strategy, all of which were designed to better balance the environmental and economic values of the province's land base, and many of which sustain in one form or another to this day. My role as Advanced Education Minister enabled me to implement new policies expanding access to post-secondary education, eliminating uh, adult basic education tuition, something that uh, John's government's had to do a second time, and approving construction for what has become Simon Fraser University's Surrey campus. I didn't know that at the time, but thanks to a successor government that made a great decision, that's what it now is. And as Attorney General, I was given the extraordinary opportunity to introduce Canada's first anti-slap legislation, to eradicate laws discriminating against same-sex couples, and to be the first attorney general in the province to actually speak out in favor of same-sex marriage and to advance that position in court. These experiences not only reinforced my belief in the value of public policy, but they also gave me a huge appreciation for the critical role that's played by the public service, by those dedicated public servants, public employees that John spoke about. For the truth is that in all my roles, I have been less a practitioner of public policy than an instigator of public policy. It's one thing to be given the opportunity to propose and introduce transformative policies and talk about them. It's quite another to make those policies work, to put them into action. That is the mission of the public service, from the deputy ministers who oversee the process of developing policies to the frontline staff 
who are essential to their essential to their successful implementation. And in my various ministerial roles, I came to depend upon and appreciate the dedication and talent of extraordinary public servants. And I must say it's a little intimidating because many of them are in the room this evening. Whether it was Doug MacArthur, who is in the room this evening, coming to my office a few days after being appointed Deputy Minister of Aboriginal Affairs with a detailed plan he had produced over the weekend to guide our path forward, or Jerry Armstrong as Forest Deputy, assisted by Don Wright in policy, somehow finding a way to produce forest land reserve legislation that Jerry had assured me only a few weeks before could not possibly be produced in time for a session that already had four major, major forest bills uh, coming to it. Or Gillian Wallace, sadly no longer with us, finding a legal mechanism that presented the Director of Vital Statistics, uh, that prevented the Director of Vital Statistics from denying a marriage license to a lesbian couple. Without the support of these and so many others, I would not have been able to accomplish much of anything. Thus, while I may deserve credit for being a good instigator, and I'll take it, thank you very much, these are the true practitioners of public policy whose work is too often under-recognized and under-appreciated. And there are others in this room, I can't name them all, but Don Avison, who worked as my deputy, Robin, Robin Cicery, who worked as an ADM in advanced education, uh, and many, many others in this room who are unheralded, unsung in what they do, but who really ensure that crazy instigators actually get to be effective from time to time. Now, I can say the same of those who have supported me in my service as a law dean and a university president. Deanships and presidencies, they're great positions from which to promote institutional change, to vision about how the university could be, as we've done at SFU with our vision to be Canada's engaged university and our position as a leader in showing how universities can help to build social infrastructure. But developing the strategies, implementing the programs to make that change happen, that's a collective effort. And it depends upon the abilities and commitments of an extraordinary leadership team, of motivated staff, talented staff, many of you are in this room tonight too, gifted faculty and supportive students. And I've been blessed with all of these. So I thank you. I thank you again for this wonderful recognition. It means the world to me. I'm not good at accepting it, but believe me, it means a whole bunch to me. I also want to thank those who, who have really made it possible for me to be here, though, and with whom I've had the privilege of working, and without whom none of the things for which I'm being credited this evening would have come to fruition. I also want to acknowledge my son, Dylan, who's here this evening and who's been both understanding and supportive of my forays into politics and university administration and who was required to bask in the reflected ignominy of being a politician's son. Not an easy role to play if you're in school and your dad's out there making decisions that not everyone agrees with. And finally, there's one person who more than any other has been there for me and without whose advice, example, and support, I would not be here this evening. And that's my life partner, Maureen Maloney. In addition to her extraordinary record of achievements as British Columbia's first woman law dean, first woman deputy attorney general, she's an inspiring teacher, a brilliant scholar, and an accomplished practitioner of public policy. Why she's not up here receiving this award, I can't say. What I can say is how fortunate I am to have her as my colleague, my mentor, and my companion. In addition to enduring the many failings for which you are not crediting me this evening, thankfully, She's the love of my life, and she's my best friend. So thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Dylan. Thanks to all of you who've come out this evening, and thanks especially to those of you whose contributions have enabled me to earn this recognition. And finally, thank you for public policy for, to Public Policy Forum for this extraordinary honor. It means a whole lot. Thank you so very much. <laughs>